Hello and welcome to this module on key principles of instructional design for effective online learning. My name is Dave Cook. I've been engaged in online teaching for nearly 15 years and I'm excited to share with you some things that will make your online teaching more effective. For those of you who are interested, this module was created using Office Mix and my laptop computer. In this module we'll cover six general principles of effective learning and a five-step model for instructional design. Along the way, we'll discuss several things you can do to promote active learning in an online course. There are really two fundamental issues in designing educational websites. First are the instructional methods, and second, the website design. We will talk more about the website design in another module. This module will focus on effective instructional methods. I want you to think for a moment, what are some basic principles of learning? I'm not just talking about in an online course, I'm talking about any situation in which someone is learning. Pause the presentation, write down your answers, then click the arrow key to resume. I'm sure you came up with several good principles of learning, and in fact there is no single right answer to that question. However, I'd like to share one way of looking at this. I like the model David Kaufman proposed, which comprises six core principles of learning. First, he noted that the learner should be an active contributor. Learning is not a passive process, but rather requires the learner to actively participate and engage. Second, learning is best done in the context of a real life problem. We sometimes refer to this as situated learning, namely learning that is situated in real life. Third, all learning builds on everything the learner has known or studied up to that point in his or her life. For example, when a second year medical student starts to learn about myocardial infarction, he or she does not start with a totally clean slate. Rather, that student builds on everything he or she has learned about heart attacks, whether informally or formally. This learning might have occurred through a popular TV show, personal experiences with family and friends, CPR training, previous work as a paramedic, and so forth. Some of this information may be erroneous. Some of it might be accurate. But regardless of its accuracy, this state of knowledge constitutes the real starting point for learning. Fourth, there must be some degree of self-direction in learning. Learners like to have some control over what they study. Fifth, learning is most effective when there is opportunity for practice and feedback. And finally, learners should be given the opportunity to reflect on what they are learning and how it might apply to their situation in real life. As we think about learning, it helps to understand a little bit about how the brain works. Information comes into our brain through our senses, usually our eyes and ears. This information is evanescent. The words or sounds are gone as quickly as they were introduced. But this information passes into our working memory. Information in the working memory persists for a few seconds. During that time, the new information must be linked and integrated with previously stored information. And then this record is stored in the long-term memory. This process of linking is called elaboration. Unfortunately, the working memory can handle only about seven items at a time. This limit can present a problem if there is too much information, if the information is too complicated, or if there are distractions that compete for limited cognitive resources. Cognitive overload occurs if information overwhelms the working memory's capacity. We'll talk more about cognitive overload and how to avoid it in another module. Once information makes its way to long-term storage, it is permanent, and there does not appear to be any limit in the information that can be stored in the long-term memory. However, getting that information back out from long-term storage can sometimes be a problem. Being able to retrieve the right information later on depends in large part upon the effectiveness of elaboration. Thus, elaboration is the critical step in learning. I conceptualize learning as an active process, with the learner in the middle constructing new knowledge or new meaning through the process of elaboration. What are the key contributing factors? Well, there's interaction with the teacher or guide. There are working materials, such as prior knowledge and experiences, and new information and new experiences. The environment also plays a role. In face-to-face -face learning, this would be a lecture hall or a small group discussion. In an online course, it is the web page. And then, of course, there are the learner's intrinsic traits, such as their personality, their learning styles, their motivation, and so forth. 
In a face-to-face -face course, the student and teacher interact directly. In an online course, the interaction is different and indirect. The instructor interacts with the learner primarily by controlling the environment or website design and by controlling the instructional methods that comprise new information and experiences and serve to bring appropriate prior knowledge and experiences into working memory. The instructor has little control over motivation, personality, or learning styles, so as a teacher, you need to focus your attention on the elements you can control and those that have the greatest influence. So how can we facilitate active learning on the web? I'd like you to pause for a moment and write down two methods you've used or seen used in a past face-to-face -face course. Then I'd like you to think about how you might implement similar activities in an online course. You might think back to delivery methods we discussed in an earlier module. Pause this presentation and write down your answers, then click the arrow to resume. Well, I really wish I could see what you came up with, but since I can't, I'll make a few general comments about converting face-to-face -face activities to an online format. Using today's technologies, we can mimic just about anything in an online environment. We can use online tutorials like this to take the place of a lecture. We can use an online discussion board to substitute for face-to-face -face discussion. We can use photos and videos to teach procedures. We can use virtual patients to teach interviewing skills, and so forth. The question really isn't, can we? The question is, should we adapt? Or more appropriately, is this the most effective and efficient way to promote learning in this specific situation? Sometimes it works great to adapt a face-to-face -face method to an online setting. Other times, we need an entirely new online approach. What was done using a lecture might be do better done using an online group activity. And sometimes we need to acknowledge that a face-to-face -face approach is still best for a given set of needs. Remember that blended learning, which combines the best elements of online and face-to-face -face learning, might be the best solution. In the rest of this module, I'm going to describe a five-step model for instructional design, five first principles of instruction. David Merrill developed these principles by reviewing multiple learning theories, about 40 theories in all. He looked over these theories for common themes and common principles. He reasoned that if a principle shows up in multiple different learning theories, it is likely to be true. So these five principles are those that showed up over and over across multiple learning theories. The first principle is that learning requires activation of prior knowledge. We've already talked about this briefly, and it's very important. You'll recall that learning involves the integration of new information and experiences with information already stored in memory. Somehow, those long-term memories must be recalled to the working memory. This process of bringing back prior knowledge into working memory is called activation. You can activate prior knowledge by having learners analyze a problem, respond to topical questions, or generate their own questions on a topic. You can also have them study an advance organizer, a picture, table, or some other short summary or outline of the information that will later be communicated. Finally, you could have them engage in their own experience and then try to interpret their data. It is then important to demonstrate how to use the information and not just talk about it. For example, if you're talking about the use of a statistical test, you'd probably want to show an example and perhaps a non-example of how and when to use that test in practice. If you are showing a medical procedure, a picture or a video of that procedure might be helpful. Sometimes diagrams and animations are helpful to illustrate a process. As you demonstrate, it is important to show more than one example or case. It is particularly helpful if you show multiple representations or multiple points of view for a particularly important concept or procedure. Multimedia can often be helpful in this situation. Graphics, video, or changes in text can emphasize important content. The emphasis during this demonstration phase is to build mental models in working memory and store these in long-term memory, models that can then be retrieved at a subsequent appropriate time. You can do this using analogies, by teaching the how and why of a concept, and by actively promoting elaboration in working memory. You can promote elaboration by asking questions, by asking people to draw concept maps, or by linking relevant information. You can encourage learners to self-question or to work with one another through online collaboration. Next, as a teacher, you should provide opportunities for learners to apply what they have learned. 
They should solve problems, and preferably more than one problem. These problems should represent real life, and the complexity or difficulty should be on par with the objectives of the course. They should be ne neither too hard nor too easy. Sometimes it is helpful to have learners solve problems alone, but if possible, it is usually more effective for them to work in small groups. These application activities can take the form of simulations, written cases, or other problems. Coaching is helpful initially, but should fade over time as learners become more proficient in applying what they know. It is often effective for problems to become progressively more difficult. Feedback can be helpful. In a computer-based course, this could be automated, or it can come directly from the instructor. Finally, it is important to have learners reflect on their answers and how they might have done things differently if they were to do it again. The fourth step is to integrate what they have done, to go public, if you will. This could be done by reflecting upon what they've learned, sharing it with others, teaching someone, defending it, and so forth. Finally, all of these activities should be done in the context of a real-life problem, a problem representative of something they might encounter in real life. In other words, all four of these earlier steps, activation, demonstration, application, and integration, should build together so that learners can apply what they learned in a future situation. These principles of instructional design comprise a cycle that revolves around the real-life problem. It is usually best to start with activation of prior knowledge and proceed in sequence around each stage. Now you probably already realized that these first principles of instruction are not unique to online courses. They are generally applicable to virtually any teaching activity. They provide a strong foundation that you can use when you're designing an online course or any other course. Well, that concludes this module. I hope you found it useful, and I hope you now feel better prepared to develop instructional activities that will facilitate active online learning. Good luck!